Matt Avery joined Run Sign Up in May of 2015 and is currently the product manager for Race Day with Run Sign Up. He coordinates with both the support team and the development team to determine priority of features and bug fixes to be developed for our suite of Race Day products. In a prior life, Matt was the operations manager for Yellow Jacket Racing, a timing and event production company in Western New York. Pass it over to you, Matt. Thanks so much, Lauren. Um, happy again to be uh, speaking with y'all about uh, race day scoring. Uh, today, we're going to be doing a little overview uh, and a refresher on um, race day scoring. So um, it's been a little bit since I have done an updates webinar for you all. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of that. And I'm also going to do a little bit of uh, just diving into the software, showing you around. There's some familiar names in the um, participant list that I see here. So um, I'm sure that we'll be getting some really great questions towards the end of the session. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, jump right in. So um, we all know that timing in person events hasn't been at the forefront of everyone's thoughts past couple of months. But uh, we're starting to see races, in-person events, starting back up again in different types of formats. And now's the time to dust off timing laptops and see what's new with race day scoring. So today I, uh, I broke down a bunch of the recent updates that we've made into a few main categories. And so I'm just going to go over with you, first off, those uh, categories and those updates that we've made there. Because I think some of them are pretty exciting and pertinent to the type of timing that uh, we're seeing happening with the uh, races coming up again with COVID. So the first being this concept of open-ended timing, and I'll dive into that in a minute. Um, we've improved a lot with participant data handling and options for participant data. We've made a bunch of changes to make the setup of the race easier. We've been trying as much as we can to um, take your user feedback and translate that to um, development to try and make the software easier to use when you're actually out setting up a race as well as scoring, which leads into the next point, trying to improve the actual waste day experience. Um, we're you know, always taking a look at how our, people, our timers are using the software and how we can improve their experience. So um, with all this said, always love to hear from you and sometimes you know may feel like you're bothering me if you're emailing me all the time or emailing me a ton of feature requests but honestly it's really helpful and it does um, inform what gets developed in our software well, that's one of the unique things that you'll find about our company and our organizational structure is that we're pretty pretty small and we take uh, user feedback very seriously so it's important to us to have this relationship with you as the customer so that we can get really good feedback on our products and try and make uh, the updates necessary to make your lives easier. This is a two-way street and we're here to help you. So uh, after the updates, I'm gonna leave some time to open it up to questions. I'm assuming we're gonna get a bunch of different questions from folks and I'm more than happy to answer them on the fly if I can and dive into the software and demonstrate some things if need be. Um, so please type out any questions into the chat. Uh, Crisp is going to be monitoring that and will uh, bring up any questions to me that he thinks should be brought up to the whole group. Um, he may also just answer any questions uh, as they come in. Roger Bradshaw is also assisting with the chat monitoring. So if you do have any questions on race director specifically, now would be a good time to put those into the chat as well. Um, so yeah, he'll bring up any questions came up, weren't answered in the session, or if anything needs clarification, so on and so forth. Okay, so let's talk about open-ended timing. So we've been um, putting features out for this concept of an open-ended race for the past couple of months now. The concept, if you don't know what it is, is uh, allows you to set up your timing software to allow races to play out over the course of hours or even days. So it'll allow you to set up a very long acceptable start and finish time period, which can overlap if you're timing an event that's allowing participants to start and finish whenever they like instead of en masse. So we've added some features in race day scoring and the race director to make this easier to manage as a timer. 
it's obviously a little bit different from the standard race scenario where everybody is going to, you know, show up to the race and they're going to, you know, walk over the mats a few times before the start, but they all start at the same time and they all finish starting around the same time. With open-ended timing, we're seeing some events set up really long windows of start and finish uh, time ranges and allowing them to overlap. So this is a a problem that was, uh, it was a big problem for the way that race director and race day scoring managed um, timing and data. So we had to make some big changes to the software to handle this. So I'm gonna go through uh, the details on these new features that we added to make open-ended timing scenarios easier for you in race day scoring. So race director does have this as well if you're still interested in checking that out. And uh, we have a great guide written out for that that Roger put together on our race director Google group. So if you do have any questions on how to set this up for the race director software, uh, all the information you need we have. So just let us know. Okay, so with open end end uh, timing, basically you have to have um, you have to have a time starting and finish filters in order to say when the last expected start time would be and the first expected finish time would be for any race. With overlapping or open-ended timing, you can now allow those to overlap. So in order for this to work in race day scoring, you have to have your timing locations set up as a common start finish location. So in race day scoring, I'm just gonna jump out into race day scoring here. Under the timing locations tab, you can go to this settings and um, adjust in a, a, a timing location you already have, or you can add a new one. By default, we have a start and a finish that we just create for you when you set up a race. You can certainly get rid of those default locations and add new ones or edit the existing ones. We just set it up for uh, the basic race scenario to make things a little bit easier, but a lot of times, you wanna edit that, those settings. So you can just come into here and click settings to change those. So this is an example of a race that is using open-ended timing and actually scored a 5K over the course of a day. Uh, Chris timed this one, he did a really good job with it. It was kind of a demo of uh, this feature when we first released it. So what I'll show you here is in settings, there's this option here to determine what type of times are going to be collected at this location. In order for open-ended timing to work in race day scoring, you do have to have this set to be start and finish times. And then you have to say here, when do you wanna stop collecting start times? And it's gonna stop at noon on the third. When do I want to begin collecting finish? Well, it's gonna start on the second at six or 7 a.m. basically. So you can see that there's an overlap now. We're gonna um, begin collecting finish times before we stop collecting start times. So that is basically going to trigger the system to know that this is going to be an open-ended timing race. So you have to make sure there's that overlap there in order for this all to work. And it has to be a common start finish. If you have it just as a finish, you'll see the one set of filters and information settings go away. Similarly, if it's a start time only location, you'll see here it only the start information is set. So I see some confusion around um, managing these locations a lot of the time. People don't quite understand uh, that the defaults are there, um, but they can be deleted or removed or changed, and that's certainly possible. Sometimes I'll see folks create a common start finish race and they'll edit the start to collect start and finish times, but they'll leave the finish and then they forget to change out the uh, what location they're actually finishing on and it can cause some confusion. So uh, I just wanted to go over that. You are able to go in and delete these if you need to and change out the settings in whatever way you want. And then you can go in and assign them to different events and the different segments later on in the setup. So you'll see in this um, event, I actually have a bunch of different distances. So for this race, there's um, actually four different scored events. 
and four different registration events. So one mile, a 5K, a five mile, and a 10K. So for this event, they actually were able to select and say that they wanted to run a one mile, a 5K, or a five mile, or a 10K. Um, but they actually were all starting and finishing at the same reader. So Crisp had set out one, you know, or a couple of readers, I think maybe, in a single location. And people were all starting and finishing on that same location. So it's all good and well. The only problem with open-ended timing is the way it works is, I'll go to the next slide here. Oops, actually, yeah. We recommend that you set these up as a separate distance. Basically, you'll want for open-ended timing a location for each distance people may be running. So it may not be one location per event. You might have like five events that are running one mile and five events that are running a 5K. And you could just use one one mile location and one 5K location. The reason we recommend that, I'll talk about here. The reason we have separate locations for each of those distances is we use this gap factor to determine what the minimum acceptable net time should be for that location and the event associated with that location. So for instance, I've got a 10K here and I know that no one's running faster than a 30 minute 10K today. So I put my gap factor set to 30 minutes for my 10K location that I'm going to assign to my 10K scored event later on. <clears throat> the reason that's important is because with open-ended timing, people are gonna be starting and finishing all over the place. And if you have a single gap factor, your minimum split time will be applied to basically only the, the, the shortest distance event you have. So if you had this setup, a one mile 5K, five mile and a 10K, all on one location, what will happen is you'll have to be, you'll be forced to set your gap time to be like four minutes, right? Because that's the minimum accepted one mile time, let's say. Well, that could cause some serious problems for the 10K or the five mile because you might get a bunch of different reads from people who are going to get their um, bibs early on in the day. They walk over the start, they walk over the start again, and they come back four hours later and actually do their run. It can miss trigger. So having separate locations for each distance really helps with um, you being able to control that data better to be able to set this gap factor for each distance. So I really recommend this. You know, your 5K could be 10, 14 minutes, your 10K 30 minutes, half marathon an hour, whatever. So when you do this setup, what's happening is race day scoring, it's going to look for and mark the first set of reads for each participant within this time range that is longer than the gap factor. So if I went in and I ran um, a, you know, a 40 minute 10K, and then uh, I had two sets of reads later on in the day that just happened to be 47 minutes or even 35 minutes away from each other. The system's going to say, well, those are two potentially good times for Matt. Um, even if, you know, I was driving across the finish line or something weird happened, um, the system would have no way of telling the difference between those two. But it's just going to pick the first set because we have to make some kind of determination. We have to figure out which of those two sets of reads are the actual legitimate ones. So we just always pick the first set. That might not, not always be accurate, but it's just what we have to do. So again, we always pick the first set of reads for each participant within the time range set here that is longer than the gap factor. So that obviously is a problem. Um, you know, people are gonna have all sorts of reads for an open-ended timing use case. They're gonna walk over the start line and get their bib and then come back. And I know as, but, you know as good as anyone else out there, as much as you wanna try and manage a start and finish location area, it's really hard to do in actuality. And it's even harder to do if you're trying to do it for a whole day or over the course of two days. So um, that's uh, why we've implemented the next thing which is uh, this ambiguous times button on the raw reads view. So the raw reads view lets you take a look at all the reads that your systems have accepted and dumped into race day scoring. This ambiguous times button allows you to view for each location, all of the 
reads that were potentially good. If um, basically if a person has multiple sets of potentially good reads, it'll show you that set. So Maddie Babbitt here, I click that button, I'd see this. Maddie Babbitt has two reads. She has a 13 minute one mile and a nine minute one mile. And it tells me here their start time of day and date and their finish time of day and date for that set of reads. And by default, it selected the first one. Now, maybe that was a, you know, actually not correct. And I wanted to actually select this one. You could just check that box and it will flip it over and it'll all work. So I'll just show you that in the actual application here. So ambiguous times. I have these one mile times and I know I've got some 10 K times here. So like Marcus, he actually had, he had three sets of times, a 47 minute one and a one hour and nine minute one and a 30 minute one. So let's say Marcus did this event and um, you know, he came over at, he sent you a note afterwards and said, Hey, you know, I saw my time was actually shorter than what it should have been. And he said, I, I actually ran a one Oh nine. I don't want to be a cheater. Um, can you update it for me? And you can take a look and see like, Oh yeah. Looks like he had three potentially good times here. So all he'd have to do to say, don't use this 47 minute and use this one instead is just go and check this box. And uh, you can go to Marcus's participant record and it will update in just a minute here. So I can go and look at the report actually, the 10K. And he's now got that 109 time. So that's how that ambiguous times viewer and uh, editor works. Another thing we added for open-ended timing, uh, you can come into report and add any number of fields with race day scoring. One of the ones we recently added was the ability to plug in the time of day of the start and the finish and any kind of splits if you wanted to do that. So um, right in this report, I've added a field for the start time of day and the finish time of day. So this is really helpful for uh, like validation or verification. Um, just so you can see like the date and time that results that came in for multi-day race setups or if you just wanted to see like uh, even for a mud run, this would be really useful where people are starting and finishing throughout the day. If you want to see what wave they started in, you could just report it or include it in the report here. So what I'll do is just show you guys in the reports what I would need to do to add that. So let's say I've got this 5k report. And I've got my clock time, I've got my chip time, but I don't have uh, this time of day that I wanna see here. So I'll just do a quick run through of how to edit a report and add some fields to it. So I've got this overall report and uh, this is all set up for me by default in race day scoring. When I come in and save this scored events tab for the very first time, it looks in and sees I've got a one mile, a 5K, a five mile and a 10K. And when you do this, it says, that uh, my reports have been updated automatically or successfully. If this were the first time doing it, it would say that they've been added successfully. So this screen determines the reports over here. So uh, like I said, I can come into here and just click actions and edit. Again, if I wanted to edit this, just actions and edit. This report builder will allow me to do all sorts of things with this report. Now, by default, I only have one report section, my overall list of 5K runners. This includes a list of every single 5K runner I have in order by uh, chip time or clock time or whatever I decided to sort the scored event on. So uh, you can do all sorts of things. Like I said, you can add in other report sections if you wanted to just by clicking, you know, overall section. Or if I wanted an age group section, I could add that in. I could move them around, I could delete them, I could do all those things. Now today, uh, I don't wanna add another section. What I wanna do is actually just come in here and edit this existing section. I wanna, I wanna add some columns or move them around. So if you expand these little panels, you'll see that I have all of these different columns in this report section 
that I'm able to move around, that I'm able to delete, that I'm able to rename, and all sorts of things. So uh, if I wanted to, what I could do is, I don't like this clock time. The clock time is pretty meaningless for this type of event. Um, so I actually don't want to have that in my report. But what I do want to have is a new column in here for time of day. And I highly recommend if you are adding in information here, don't just <laughs> scroll through because if you have a complicated array setup with a lot of splits, you're going to be scrolling for days. So uh, big hint, just type in time of day and we'll start to see these different things that show up related to what I'm typing. So here I have an entire race start time of day and an entire race start date time of day. So if I wanted to include the date, I could. For this one, I know they all basically started and finished on the same day. So I'm just gonna do entire race start time of day and I'm gonna do entire race finish time of day. Now, entire race start time of day is a pretty long title. So if I click the little pencil icon in the header here, I'm gonna just change this label to start TOD. I'm gonna close it. And I'm gonna go to here and finish TOD. Close it. And let's say um, I want these columns to actually be reordered. I'm just gonna place uh, paste down here and that looks pretty good so um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna save this if I wanted to there's other things you can do with these report sections you can do use filters to do all sorts of crazy things like filter based on some data and um, just only show the top 10 or show non finishers or do all sorts of things I'm not gonna do that here I'm just gonna save the report so my report's been updated successfully, it says, good. And uh, I'm just gonna check it out, see what's going on here. So now I've got my start TOD and my finish TOD. So I can see, you know, this person ran 2828. 28. Now, if that's suspicious or whatever, I could take a look and see, oh, well, he, you know, this looks good. He looks legit. He started at 8.29 a.m. and he finished at 8.57 and that looks good. Um, so you can always go back and verify this further if I wanted to. I can, grab his uh, bib number, 1718. I could go into this raw reads view. I could plug it in and I could see, you know, yep, these are the ones that, that we decided were the correct ones for him. Maybe I wanted to check out 1718 here for the 5K. Nope, he didn't have any, there were no ambiguous times for the 5K. So these are the only set of reads that could have been accurate for, for Steven. So that all looks good. Cool, so let's keep moving on. That's just a little bit of a deep dive into reporting, but I know it's something that people get stuck on a lot. I wanted to go through it. Did I talk about this last point? Yeah. All right, so the next section is better participant data handling. So uh, we're getting a lot of requests around um, adding more options for managing participant data in race day scoring. And I'm happy to you know tell you all about the new stuff we've recently added. We've been able to um, put out some really cool things that people have been asking for for quite a while. So I'm happy to talk about this. Um, big thing is uh, team names can now be imported when you're importing a spreadsheet. So um, in race day scoring, you have options to either just import a race directly from run sign up if it was on run sign up already, or you can create a race, manually set it up and import participants from a spreadsheet. Uh, for instance, if you had some other um, third-party registration provider that you were, uh, that a race was using that you are timing, you can just import a spreadsheet of participant info and you know, score them that way, no issues at all. Um, the one thing that was tricky was you couldn't import team names into race day scoring. Well, we now have added that. So if you uh, just map that column of team name into race day scoring when you import a CSV spreadsheet, It'll automatically set up the groups if uh, that team name doesn't exist in race day scoring yet. And it will um, add members to groups if the team name does exist in race day scoring. So it's a really nice system. Um, just allows you to really quickly import a spreadsheet. And if you happen to have team names, just throw it in there really quick. You don't have to go into run sign up and create groups for them and import them down. 
uh, it's just, you know, all you have to do now is import in the spreadsheet if uh, that's what your situation is. Excuse me. Next uh, bit is we added support for uh, custom fields for participants. So this is a big one. It allows you to add in additional data fields that you want to use for scoring, but you don't necessarily need them published to run sign up. So uh, the idea is that um, in race day scoring, you have the option of importing uh, run sign up custom questions from uh, run sign up to be used for scoring. So a lot of times you see people set up things like Clydesdale and Athena on run sign up as custom questions. And they'll say uh, that their categories are based on their custom question responses from run sign up. Uh, now, sometimes races don't, if they're not using run sign up, then you wouldn't have those questions set up. So it was kind of difficult to add in custom fields or um, add in custom question responses for participants if they weren't coming from run sign up. So now we let you create custom fields in race day scoring that are basically like custom questions just in race day scoring. And uh, you can just uh, come into your participant sync area and you'll see a new button to add custom fields. And I'll just show you what that looks like really quick. I don't know if I added it here. Yeah, I did. Okay, so I added in here a local, let's call local question. Um, if yeah, I use this add custom fields button, it would uh, show me that. So I've added in a category custom question and uh, I've called it category and I've added some options, Clydesdale and Athena. And you could add other ones if you wanted to, to track other pieces of information if you needed to. And you could import, um, you can map to this like, you know, category field when you're processing a spreadsheet import. So it's really handy if you need to um, do things like filter reports. So um, if I wanted to, let's say, take a report that I was working on and edit it and say, okay, I like my 5K overall list, but I also want to add a 5K overall section to this report that is filtered. And I'm going to say that it is, uh, it is going to be a participant display filter. And um, basically what that does is it doesn't change the placements for people. All it does is um, changes the display. So their placement will not change, which for this I don't want. So I'm going to say category equals Clydesdale. Now this isn't a great example because I don't have any data in here for Clydesdale, Athena. But uh, if I were to have it, they would show in this report section. Um, So I think I could do this, 1712. Let's say 1712 has, it's actually Clydesdale. Not, not accurate, obviously, because she is a woman and wouldn't be in Clydesdale, she'd be in Athena. But for the uh, example, I'm just gonna do that. And we should see that the uh, report section gets added here. Looks like it's not, not sure why, but um, that's what it should do. Um, so basically you can use that to um, drive reports. You can do things like set up top finisher categories. If you wanted to have a Clydesdale band for the top three males and females, you can set a participant filter using category here. You can do all sorts of stuff um, with these custom fields and any fields on the participant data record. So, you know, name, state, zip, all these things you can use to drive a um, top finisher category or a report section. So those are really handy and good to know how to use. This new feature here, custom fields, allows you to, you know, add in some pretty cool stuff and uh, just knowing that this doesn't get sent up to run sign up so you wouldn't have to uh, worry about it messing up their registration information so you can certainly still use this for non or for run sign up registration races just know it doesn't sync back up to run sign up it's only a local type thing all right so some more things you've added that are kind of related is uh, we now have support for the membership numbers from run sign up. So run sign up has 
some USAT number and USAC number and custom membership number integrations in the registration form. So participants, when they come in to register for this, um, this uh, race here, they can plug in their USAT membership or they can purchase one and on their run sign up registration record, it will have a field for their membership numbers. Um, we now support uh, adding those fields into race day scoring. So for your USA triathlon official reports that you send over to them, um, you can include the USAT membership number as a field in a report section, for instance. So I don't know if this race actually has membership numbers. It looks like it may not, but if it did, I could um, see them here and I could see that there's a, a field called memberships and uh, it's called USAT membership number. And I could now come in and say for my age group report, um, I'm gonna edit that, add a column for a USAT membership number. And I can move it around because the order is important and save it and it will um, show their membership numbers in the report. So that's really handy if you need to uh, submit reports to USAT or USATF, and things like that. So again, that works with USAT, USATF, USAC, and uh, custom memberships on run sign up. Um, another nice feature we added, <clears throat> excuse me, was uh, support for auto mixed case name for formatting. This setting will automatically properly capitalize different names and is smart enough to handle things like uh, McDonald. We've added in a few special cases to try and handle like a mixed case in a single string like McDonald. Um, we don't support forcing all capital. And the reason for that is uh, run sign up uh, does really, really, really does not want all capitals in their database because it sends out emails and does all sorts of things with that information and we update that and uh, we do not want to be sending out emails with all caps, unfortunately. <laughs> so that was a hard no from the run setup developers, unfortunately. Someone's asking if they have a USATF number, could you display a U next to their name? Um, you could set something up to do that custom in race day scoring. Um, I could set, show you how to do that. It's a bit complicated, but you could add in a, uh, a field in race day scoring to do that for you. Basically, if there's anything in the USAT number field, just display a U instead of the number. It's possible. It's just kind of a hard setup. So I'm not going to walk through it here. Okay, let's talk about uh, a few things we've done to make the setup of races easier. So this one, um, really helpful if you're doing triathlons. Race segments can now be copied from one event to any number of other events, um, making triathlons much easier to set up. Basically, you come into your segment setup, select a segment, and then copy. And it will allow you to copy, like, uh, say, I want to copy my setup from age group athletes to collegiate athlete, high school and junior athlete, all these other scored events I have because the triathlon is the same for all. Maybe you do have a duathlon that's a different segment setup, but all of your triathlon ones are the same basically. So you just come in here and pick which events you wanna to transfer to or copy to and then select paste and it will just copy the segments over. Um, one thing that's important, read these note panels if you see them. Uh, you must select each event that you have copied to and save the page for each one after doing that. Basically, we have to go through each segment that you've copied to and save that individual page. Otherwise, you'll lose any type of changes and you'll want to verify everything anyways. So basically, when you do this paste, you have to walk through the segments and just double check everything's good and click save. So if you go into here, under segments, let's pick collegiate athlete, copy, from this one to let's say this one and this one and that one. I'm gonna mess up uh, this triathlon quite a bit, but it's only just scoring, doesn't matter that much. So I've pasted it to those. So I'm just gonna walk through and save. Yep, so this one's saying it's a, I've got some issues with the setup here. Basically the cumulative distances aren't adding up. So I've got to fix that. 
probably just an issue with a setup file. But, um, that's why I'd want to walk through those is just to verify that all of the uh, all of the segments are correctly set up with their cumulative distances and segment distances adding up. Cool. So another thing we've added was an alert. When you're, uh, when you're working on a run sign up race, if the event distance doesn't match the scored event distance and race day scoring, uh, we just let you know, we give you a little message that says, hey, the event distance on run sign up doesn't match what it, we're saying it is in race day scoring. The reason we tell you about this is that the pace that is shown on run sign up is determined based on the event distance in run sign up, not the event or the scored event distance in race day scoring. So if it doesn't match, your paces aren't going to match. So we give you a little link. It's a shortcut to the wizard step on run sign up for this race where you can adjust the event distance that doesn't match. So um, let's say I was in this race. And... This is a run sign up race, I know, because I can hover over this little name here and I can click to go to the dashboard. Um, let's say that this segment, I accidentally set to three miles and I saved it. It's gonna tell me, hey, some scored events, entire race segments currently have a different distance than their event distance. This may cause participants to see an incorrect pace on run sign up to see uh, to change the event distances, please click here. So it tells me my entire race segment for the 5K run has a distance of three miles. Current event distance is 3.1 miles. So if this really were a three mile race, not a 3.1, I'd be able to click here and it will just tell, show me where I can change this to three miles. I don't want to actually do that. This is a, someone's race, so I'm not going to. But that's a, just a nice little feature to help you um, cover your tracks a little bit in case you mess something up or you forgot to set the event distance here on run sign up. Um, so that should help you out a little bit. All right. So uh, we've improved the auto saves and we've continuing to improve auto saves with race day scoring. So what auto saves are, are our way of taking a report and automatically saving it to any number of different places. So uh, one of the places is run sign up. You can publish results to run sign up directly from race day scoring using a report auto save. You can also do auto saves to kiosk computers, to spreadsheets, to PDFs, to HTML reports, all sorts of other things. Um, so this is how you manage and set up online results for, run, for race day scoring to run sign up. So we've uh, made this a little bit easier when you set up our autosave. Uh, we now basically, uh, if you come into a report, you'll see that there's an option to set up an autosave for that report. And you'll notice here, just backing up, if uh, you haven't had too much experience with race day scoring, you'll notice that uh, the age group report doesn't have this autosave option. And the reason is that you only ever need to set up an autosave for each distance one time. Run sign up actually creates the age groups based on the age groups I've set up in race day scoring. So you don't need to publish the age group report and the overall report for each distance. You only need to publish the overall report for each distance. So if I were to want to set up um, run signup results for this, I'll just come in here, click auto save. And I'm going to say, I want to add a run signup results auto save stream. And by default, I fill in some fields that are um, uh, available to me here. I'm going to auto save every 30 seconds. Uh, the name I've just defaulted to the 5K run overall report seems fine. The scored event is the 5K. The pace display is time per mile. And my questions email is the one that I logged into race day scoring with. Um, so before we would not set pace display, we would not set scored event. Um, and we would not set autosave every. So you had to come in and, you know, when you were setting up these autosaves, you'd come in and you'd say, okay, well, now that's exactly what it used to do, by the way, is it would have all of these blank, like you see here. So now when I click autosave and add it, all of these things are preset for me. So all I have to do is click add stream and then save settings. 
I'm not gonna do that because I don't wanna actually publish this. So I'm gonna delete that stream. I'm gonna delete it. So um, that's really important to get. Uh, basically all you're doing when you're setting up auto saves is coming in, clicking plus, saving, add stream here. Now I have this one stream going and I'm gonna click save settings to confirm those changes. Um, so it's just a lot easier to set that all up now. Okay, so in addition to that, we have included auto saves in race exports. So uh, in race day scoring, you have the ability to export race files and import race files. So on the dashboard, there's this import export race definitions panel. Come in here and I can uh, export race definitions um, to basically say to, uh, I wanna send this race out to a timer, I could export it. It creates a zip file, I can email it or put it in a Dropbox folder that syncs to my timing computers. And um, those timers in the field can just grab a file that you've sent to them and import it in this way. So uh, we would now include the auto save settings when you export. So this is handy if you are setting up a bunch of races at home and uh, you're gonna be deploying them out to five different computers and you want to set up all of the run sign up results automatically. So if I were like in this race, I had a bunch of auto saves set up. Um, they're all paused right now. I could uh, export this race and load it up on a second computer. And then if I wanted to, I could just resume them all. So this is a, a new thing we also added, which I'll talk about right now. The improved auto uh, save status panel to allow pausing and unpausing all auto saves at once. It also now gives you a top level count of the number of auto saves you have set up in this race. So when I uh, now view this dashboard, I can see here I've got 13 auto saves. I'm gonna pause them all or resume them all. So this is just a quick way to just say, all right, well, I'm ready to you know, start publishing results. I can resume all my auto saves or take a look at them individually. Maybe I only wanna start the one mile or only the five mile or whatever, you can do that. So just a little bit of improvement to that. All right, and the last, oops. The last uh, thing we're gonna talk about, I think it is, um, is some things we've added to our um, scoring experience. So the last one on the auto saves kind of ventured into the scoring race day experience improvements because timers in the field are gonna be using that auto saves to uh, publish the results, but also timers back at home are gonna be setting it up. So it kind of bridged the gap. Big thing we've been working on lately is performance improvements. We're constantly working on ways to improve performance and have recently updated the system to massively improve performance for large races and specifically for races with a lot of scored events, uh, like 10 or more scored events. We still encourage you to um, set up only as many scored events as you need. Usually it's like every distance will have its own scored event, like a 5K, a 10K, a half. And then you can do different categories based on custom questions and breakout reports based on those. So we usually try and recommend to people to just keep it to each individual distance, but there are some situations where we've seen people really legitimately needing um, a bunch of scored events. And so uh, we, we saw some performance issues with races that had more than 10 scored events when saving the scored event screen or lock up the software. Um, so we found an issue that was causing that and then uh, removed it. So now you should see, um, if you do have any races that have a lot of scored events and even ones that don't have a ton should save scored events faster. So uh, that was a big one. Um, took us quite a while to determine what was going on with this. So pretty happy to get that one out. Another really cool feature that we just added that we'll be expanding on in the future is, um, automatically setting and updating these race status fields. So we've always had, or for a very long time, have had uh, race status fields for each participant. So, uh, did not start field, uh, did not finish field, uh, DQ field, uh, did not qualify field, all those. So uh, what we didn't do was we did not automatically set those fields based on things happening in the software. So it was all manual. You could come in, you could check that this person didn't finish but it would never happen automatically. So now starting like if you build a race today on version 
1.22. If you build a race now, um, the system will be smart and it will know that all participants that are added um, will be set as it did not start and did not finish. So like I said, if you create a race right now and set it up and import participants, everybody's gonna come down with did not start and did not finish set on their participant record. As soon as a start read is recorded for a participant, their did not start status will be lifted. So we know now that uh, they did start actually. And then when a participant gets an overall clock time recorded, uh, their DNF status will be lifted. So um, basically what it will do is automatically set and unset those fields, which makes um, processing of reports a lot easier. So uh, you are able to, in reports, if I wanted to, come in and edit a report. And under filters, I could say I want to show non-finishers or I want to show non-starters. So you have some capabilities here, and this just makes, uh, this new feature makes these settings more useful because uh, you might want to be able to see, let's say you wanted to add a report that's just a list of all of the non-starters. You could add a report section that's just a non-starter list for this event or whatever. So it could be pretty useful to do things like that. Now, on top of this, we are going to be adding some really cool features. Um, so this is kind of the start of uh, a big project we want to do around automating uh, a race, like a progress report type of deal. And so we're going to be, um, first, we're going to be actually updating reports to better reflect the sorting of non-finishers. Uh, so right now, if you include non-finishers on, let's say, a triathlon, the uh, non-finishers aren't going to be sorted the way that you might want them to be, which is like the most number of segments completed in the lowest time. It's kind of random. So we know that's an issue. It's been an issue forever in race day scoring. So um, we wanted to do this work to automatically set and unset these status fields before we worked on this change to allow them to sort by the number of segments completed and the shortest time. So over the next couple of weeks, we'll have this feature to correctly sort non-finishers by the number of completed segments than the lowest time total. Also, we're working on a way to display a kind of generic race progress panel on the dashboard. That'll give you some live stats, um, things like how many did not start, how many were DQ'd, how many did not finish for each scored event, and or for the entire race. So that's gonna be really, really nice and I'm super excited to have that. Uh, basically, it will allow you to uh, view the counts but also click the counts and view a list of those participants. So you'll be able to come in and see, I've got eight non-starters, give me their names. You click the link and it will show you a list of them and you could come in, you could click their name and you could um, you know, change their event or do whatever you need to do, unset their DNS. So we're going to make this uh, really nice. This is kind of the start to uh, working towards that new feature, which will be coming over the next, you know, few weeks. We'll see. Our developers have been working pretty hard, so uh, we may see this sooner than I expect. But I'm really excited to get this one out because I, I love being able to view a top level data, like how many non-finishers there are and how many DNFs and how many DNQs and how many are on course and things like that. So I think doing pretty good on time actually. So this is uh, the end of my slide deck. Um, I do wanna talk about, uh, we do have uh, Crisp here who is our expert on training for one-on-one -on -one sessions, email Crisp. And I help out with these as well, um, especially if there's really complicated sessions. But uh, Crisp is the one who coordinates all the one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions for race day scoring. So no matter how much of a beginner you are, I uh, recommend, you know, reaching out to Crisps and seeing if you uh, can set up a time for training if you're interested in it. Um, we do also just have our generic um, support inbox here, race day at runsignup.com. That's for race day scoring. And race day scoring.blog is more information, but um, we love helping you out. And if you do have any questions about using race day scoring, we recommend emailing race day at runsignup.com or even better, use the get help um, question mark in the app itself and type out your issue here. This is nice because it will actually send us a race file along with any error logs and all sorts of information that is useful to us to help you out. Um, we do have a support line available as well. 
Um, if you're using it for uh, scoring on a weekend, we have people staffed to monitor this on the weekends and are more than happy to help you out. We'd like you to, uh, you know, make sure you have the setup done the week or two prior with the event. But if you do run into something, we're more than happy to help you out. Um, usually the, the support team's not too busy on the weekends because it's not a very busy time of the week. So uh, if you do have questions on race day, do not hesitate to call. And most of the time I find it's a very simple setting change that resolves 90% of issues people have. And it's a real bummer to find out that you messed up a race and it was something very silly that could have been fixed in three seconds if you had called. So don't feel afraid to call on the weekends or, you know, uh, during the week if you have something that you need assistance with. All right, so I've hit my time goal and I wanna uh, open up for questions, but I guess I'll just uh, ask Chris if there'd been any uh, ones that have come into the chat that you wanted to bring up. I think most have been answered. Nice, I must be psychic. I haven't <laughs> been monitoring the questions at all. This is great. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I guess I'll ask uh, again, if anybody has anything they want me to walk through um, even if it's a, you think it's a silly, stupid question and no question is a stupid question and I'm more than happy to show you, um, or help you out right now. <laughs> 